Hello and welcome to this episode of T-Tech. On today's episode, we're going to discuss building network firewalls. So, this is intended to be a basic overview. We're not going to go into configuration of them, which one is better for a certain task, etc. This is just to get you versed in all the options you have. So, why should you do this? Well, the main reasons would be security, first of all, because you have such fine-grained control over your packets going through your network when you implement a firewall like this. So you can control how they can flow, where they can or cannot flow, and other things like that as well. Going along with that, you also have visibility into the network. You can see the traffic. Again, you can see every little thing about the network, how many computers you have, what they're doing, how often they're doing it. Some of the options we're going to discuss even have things like IDS and IPS systems in them. So you can monitor for malicious traffic and act accordingly. You also have a the updates is another thing, the frequency of them. With a normal, something like a Wi-Fi router, the firmware isn't always updated very often, if at all, once they make that system. But with these systems, you have updates, and a lot of them are actively developed. Now, going along with the visibility, the logging with a lot of these systems is very good. They will make graphs like pie charts and things that really help you get a handle on what's happening in the network. Now, flexibility is an important point with this as well. Since you're usually taking a spare machine and installing the software on it, you have the flexibility to change the hardware whenever you wish. You can change the software and you can upgrade the hardware. So that also leads to migration advantages because you're not stuck to a certain uh, piece of software, a certain configuration, or a certain hardware. And, la and almost last but not least is learning. So you're going to learn a lot in this process, especially if you've never done it before. Even if you know a lot about networking, um, you're still going to learn because sometimes you you configure all this stuff on, you know, hardware firewalls from Cisco, Juniper, uh, SonicWall, etc. But a lot of those systems, you don't have to build out all the software underneath and write all the rules to make everything work. So, regardless, you will learn something. That doesn't mean you don't know a lot now, but you will always learn more through this process. So, um, last few we have here. Scalability. You can... You could build another box and load balance traffic between them if you wanted to. You can expand it again because you can take that one box, you install it today, maybe three months from now, it's just not quite quick enough. CPU isn't fast enough, you're trying to run more services, so then maybe you start running out of RAM. You can upgrade it, you can add more RAM very easily. It's just normal computer hardware. So again, you have expandability because of that. You have upgradability both in the software and in the hardware. So with all of those in mind, now we're gonna discuss some hardware types. So first of all, we have hardware firewalls and that's what I had mentioned uh, before about the Cisco Juniper and all of that. These are the what we're probably starting from now, I don't mean you usually have a Cisco um, ISR router in your house, but um, what you will have is a Wi-Fi router. Well, in a way, a Wi-Fi router is still a hardware firewall. It has firewalling functions, and it is a system that is purpose-built to be a firewall. That's what hardware firewall usually means. So the types of systems, though, for this... In, um, what this is covering is what you would have to purchase or maybe find in, you know, your closet or at your employer or someplace like that where you would get these systems. So embedded systems. 
These are things like PC Engine machines. Those are little embedded boards. Um, like, let's see, they, they have the APU is one of their options. They have um, newer versions of that now. Things like that. Uh, Socrus is a good option. Mostly now, though, secondhand, unfortunately. As far as I know, they have ceased um, selling them, in the United States at least. Um, lastly, though, for the embedded side of things, are single board computers. Single board computers are great. Raspberry Pis, uh, Rock 64s, um, lots of other ones. Do I need a name? But anyway, to summarize the embedded systems, uh, low power is a great thing. There's no moving parts, so you have less things to fail. But there, the cons would be you it's embedded, so it's hard to upgrade the hardware without buying an entire new one. Now, they're not very expensive, but everything adds up. Um, other than that, I would say mostly about those, uh, what we spoke about with those. The desktop systems. These are actually really good because they're very expandable. Both CPU um, and RAM, they're expandable. You can put network cards in them, you know, more than it came with. Um, hard drive and other things like that. But you have options. You have a full tower. We've all seen full towers. You probably have gaming PCs. Those are most likely full towers. At least the ones I build. Um, anyway, you also would have mid towers for that and even small form factor. Now, you do have to think the bigger the tower, you have to have room to store it. And more or less, there's more heat and noise involved with a bigger machine versus, versus a smaller machine. So, but you can use a desktop system, and that is actually a very good starter system in between an embedded and a desktop, because you'll start to you'll start to use it, and then you're gonna be like, oh, I really want this, or oh, I really want that, because then it will run faster. So with the desktop system, you have so much more flexibility with that, whereas with the embedded, you can move to that once you know what you want, because is in embedded, what you see is what you get, unless you have like a surface desoldering tool and really good hardware design skills but you know the desktop system is better for that um, the server systems now this is um, going into more business now because you can implement a lot of these in a business environment in branch offices in enterprises and they're they're getting very competitive nowadays more than they used to be so you can use tower servers, you can use rack servers, you know, and they can have dual power supplies, they can have ECC RAM, redundant fans, and, you know, RAID in them. You have lots of options with that, and it will still be able to run the network. Um, another odd one, but old appliances are a good option. These are like your Cisco ASAs, or your old, older than that, your Cisco PICs. Um, watch guard fireboxes. I have a lot of those in the rack right next to me right now. Those are great for, um, you know, throwing on one of these uh, distributions and making a firewall out of. You also have the Sophos uh, UTMs. Those are always good as well. But um, you have so many options for hardware, there's not really a cookie cutter solution for this. Same thing with the operating systems. It all depends on you. So, now we're going to just talk about the ways we can design our network with these systems. Just at a very broad brush level, we have LAN and WAN. So you have one LAN where you got your computers, your WAN where your internet is. You have a LAN, you can have a DMZ on that for your servers and things, then your internet. You'd have a LAN, a guest network, and then your WAN, or a combination of all four. Now this, these systems we would build would work with all internet types. Um, cable, DSL, pretty much all the variations of it, um, fiber, satellite, you know, and most newer ones, I would assume, because they will most likely have Ethernet ports on them. Now, the firewall operating system as it um, stands, th there's a lot of options, but I want you to understand, is there really such a thing as a firewall operating system? Not necessarily, but don't get all caught up on the term. I'm just using it so 
you have an idea this operating system is going to do one thing. It's going to be a firewall. And as well, before we move on, um, it will also have routing. So it's not just a firewall, um, and that's all it does. It's a firewall, and it also will route between the networks. So the options we have are vendor supported. All right, these are backed by a company. Uh, community supported, which are great uh, community projects to volunteer in, etc. Um, and lastly, custom. And those are just supported by yourself. But sometimes custom is the way to go, but we'll, we'll see in a second. So the vendor supported ones, and this is not an exhaustive list, by the way. This is just what I could uh, come up with. The first one that comes to mind is PFSense. They're backed by NetGate. And NetGate is doing very big things with that and moving up in the um, security and routing space. So that's the first one, and the website's there. Um, Untangle, it's a Linux-based one, whereas PFSense um, is a FreeBSD-based one. And again, they have appliances as well. They're moving up with things like SD-WAN and things like that, just like PFSense says. Well, I'm sorry, NetGate. OPN Sense is a fork of PFSense. Um, just, you know, that's the beauty of open source. They can fork, do what they want with it. Um, but anyway, they also have appliances and support. And many of these others actually kind of fit more of a hybrid in between both of these vendor and community. But these are just how I separated them for this. It's not the definitive, you know, this is how it is. It's, it's not like that whatsoever. So the community supported options... Uh, the first one that came to mind is Smoothwall. That was actually my first firewall I ever uh, made, was with Smoothwall. And it old uh, computer with GDR memory. <laughs> okay. Um, IP Fire is the next one. And uh, Smoothwall and IP Fire are um, both Linux based. As far as I know, Smooth, um, I'm sorry, IP Fire is forked off of Smoothwall, just like OPNSense forked off of uh, PFSense. Another one that's Linux-based is Indian. And then, of course, Sophos has their offering. They had a really long URL, though, so I had to shorten it a little bit. Uh, but if you go there, if you scroll down, um, when I was on there before filming, it said Sophos um, Firewall XG UTM. And you could click a button there and uh, get access to that. Um, another one I like is Zero Shell. It's actually a pretty small one, and um, it's very nice for um, embedded systems and things like that, and even full installs. It's got a nice web interface. Um, lastly here, I have Vios. Now, I really enjoy Vios because Vios is very similar to Cisco iOS and also um, Juniper's OS, the Junos. Um, basically, it's a small command line system. But it's uh, very good. It's not as, um, I guess, let's go through it like this real quick. The PFSense has a web interface. Untangle has an interface. OPNSense has a web interface. Smoothwall has one. IP Fire, Indian, Sophos, Zero Shell. Vias does not. Vias just has a command line environment, okay? CLI, command line interface. So do keep that in mind when you're, you know, making decisions. But go to all these websites. See what fits you the best. There's no right or wrong answer, either hardware or software, or even network layout. It all depends what you need. So lastly, some of my favorite options here are in the custom ones. We have Debian Linux. As easy as it sounds, you just you, it's harder on the software side, but not really that much. If you have system administration background, or if you really, really like to learn, and you're just going to keep clawing your way until you, you know, learn everything you can, that's great. That that will work. So CentOS is another one. Now, CentOS is, I believe, Red Hat based. But I know, I know Red Hat got bought by IBM, I want to say. But let's not hang on that for too long because that's irrelevant for this. But um, Debian Linux is a good one. CentOS, Ubuntu, uh, Fedora. So all on the Linux side, you would use something like IP tables or NF tables, depending on the Linux distribution. Um, 
The BSDs are another great option. You have OpenBSD, FreeBSD, NetBSD, um, DragonflyBSD as well. And I'm sure I missed a few of these. There's just, there's lots of them. But anyway, this was just the part where we're going to go through the layouts we can have, the hardware we need, and the operating systems we can use. And at this point, you can go out to those websites and see for yourself what fits you the best. But um, in the next section here, we're going to go and real quick examine how the network looks and how we plug all this together. So I'll see you in one second. Okay, in this part, we're going to look at our network layouts and how we connect everything together. So in the, the basic way here, how we talked about the LAN-WAN network type, and regardless of what internet connection type it is, you're going to have your WAN, your modem, your firewall, and then your LAN here, and then the rest of your devices in there. In this case, we're discussing where you would build the firewall we're discussing here. You have then another switch in front of it, and then you have a, your, let's say, existing Wi-Fi router in connected on the switch so you would put this in access point mode and what that means is it just operates at what's called layer 2 so the data link layer it's not basically going to deal with IP addresses in other words so it's not gonna separate the networks and route between them it's just gonna take the wireless part of things like your smartphones here and make that into an Ethernet signal basically send it up the switch and up to the firewall. But this would be the green side here, and then your WAN is the red. And the good thing is, if you already have the Wi-Fi router, it in the long run sometimes saves money based on, you know, how expensive the Wi-Fi router was already to begin with, and you may not want to, you know, switch over to anything else after that, and you want to reuse it. But that's how that one would work here. And here, remember, we do have a separate switch. When we build this, you'll usually put another network card in, either PCI or PCI Express, because most desktops in those systems have one um, Ethernet port. You need two. You need one for LAN, you need one for WAN, unless you do things outside of the scope of this video. But what we'll um, have once we do that is the AP, the clients can connect wirelessly. That connects to the switch. You can have some PCs here, like your gaming PCs, whatever, your PS4, whatever you have, and those connect into the switch. And then from there, you have one more connection that goes into the LAN port of the firewall, and then you have a, the connection from the other port into the modem from your ISP, and then the other side of that goes out of whatever WAN you have. So that's with a, a separate access point for your wireless. So in other words, the wireless is provided by your existing Wi-Fi router you had, and you put that in access point mode. So this is for an integrated Wi-Fi solution. Now, there's pros and cons to this, but basically you would buy either a USB um, Wi-Fi dongle or you would buy an add-in PCI or PCI Express card that has Wi-Fi and a Wi-Fi radio in it. Then you would put antennas on, usually with RPSMA, and um, you would use it that way. The cons, though, since this is integrated in your main machine, um, for instance, where my internet comes into the house, it's in the corner of the house, in the far corner of the house, not in the middle whatsoever, and that's where I have my firewall. Well, the thing is, if I set up an access point there, once you get to the other end of the house, the signal is so low by at that point that you have no, you know, bandwidth. You can't stream, you can't do anything. So, if you have the antennas in that firewall, you're not going to necessarily be able to get a good signal all the time because it's on the floor. If it's one of those big full towers, you're not going to be able to put that on a shelf, for instance. You know, someplace high where it should be in the middle of the house, ideally. But, um, 
If, um, if you have the capability, though, to put it up higher in a better position, go right ahead because then you can manage your Wi-Fi and your normal LAN traffic all from one machine. You can also take the access point. You would use something like Host APD to do this or the built-in utilities in your distribution you chose. And you would Brit, you can either bridge that to the LAN or you could have two separate networks, one for LAN and one for your wireless part. All right, so you can do it that way as well. You could even use another wireless dongle and have a guest wireless network. So then you have three networks that all have to do with your LAN and then the one for your WAN. So those are the options there. And now we're moving forward a little bit further about what you can actually do in maybe a small business or something. So if you have a LAN um, and you just need basic connectivity, the other parts might not make sense yet. But if you, if you want to learn more, stick around. So um, in here, we have the same setup where we have a firewall. We have the WAN. We have the firewall. Our LAN, our separate access point. But now we've decided that we want a DMZ because we have a server. Take note, though, in this second network, we have another switch. And then the server is connected to it. Now, that also means now we have three ports on our firewall, three Ethernet ports, and we're using three zones. And a lot of the like things like Smoothwall and IP Fire, they allow you to have these zones, and they're for that purpose. Um, but that's how you would do that, and then if you want the Internet to access the DMZ, you do port forwards between the WAN and the DMZ. So that's why you would use a DMZ, though, because even in a small business, you may want things to get into, your, like if you're posting a website, let's say, for your business, or an email server, or any other number of things, even a Minecraft server in your home. Even as a home, you could do it like that and have a Minecraft server, but more securely than just on your LAN. Because remember, the DMZ's main purpose is to separate the server from your LAN. Because you want it to be accessible from the internet freely, but you don't want your LAN to be able to be accessed by it or access it itself. So you don't want computers to access the DMZ from your, from your internal LAN. That would be a security risk. So with that said, we're, we can also add a guest network. So we could have another wireless access point. Maybe we go out and buy another Belkin or Netgear or whatever, what have you, and um, have just a guest network for that. And that would be on the blue segment. And a lot of the times on the blue segment on these, you have to specifically allow the computers access to the Internet. But even if we just had how we talked about guests and just LAN, they wouldn't be able to access the LAN unless you wrote rules to allow that. They would just be able to access the Internet otherwise. So, I mean, you can imagine that the DMZ is gone here. It would still be the same concept. You can mix and match the networks. Okay, the last one, take a deep breath, because we're going to get... The last one is going to kind of expand on these ideas, because I want this video to be useful by a wide range of people. We're going to talk about how we scale above the four um, interface roles that a lot of these distributions give us. So if we have something like this, then don't freak out. It's not that horrible, honestly. We can, basically, what this is talking about in essence is that we have a need for more groups of computers than we have physical interfaces for. That's all it means, period. So that's all the main use of VLANs is for. It's for better use of the bandwidth and saving a uh, cost savings for this for more networks than you would normally be able to implement in your budget. Now, this isn't a typical home. It really isn't. And honestly, most times you want to use VLANs, but I love to tinker. So I'm always using VLANs, but they're not super complex, but there is more moving parts. All you need to know to understand this, well, at least to 
You get the basic gist of it. Not to fully understand it, though. You would have your firewall. And you have one port going into that switch. Okay. So this is one physical switch and one wire here. And then you configure a protocol called 802.1Q. And this becomes a trunk in the firewall port. And then this has to be a managed switch. And that becomes a trunk to the firewall. Okay. So hopefully that made sense. Now moving down here, these, the ports and the connections coming off of the switch that aren't going to the firewall are called access ports. So, or in other words, untagged ports, some vendors call these. And um, what that means is that we configure the ports to belong to specific VLANs. And when we do that, that takes the physical network and logically splits it up. So ports in VLAN 200 can't talk to VLAN 30 unless we have a firewall rule and routing rules to allow that. Unless we're doing inter-VLAN routing is what this is called. To allow these to talk to each other through the firewall. But if VLAN 200 wants to talk, the frames come into the switch and they get tagged with a number, in this case 200, and the switch knows because it come, came in on those ports and it tags it and sends it back, back to the firewall and then at that point the firewall looks at layer 2 and it, that 802.1Q trunk put a VLAN ID on there so when it went out here toward the firewall it is tagged now, the frame is tagged so it knows that came from 200 but the whole thing is they're sharing one physical network and the same physical connection. If we didn't have VLANs, we'd go back to here, and you have to have one physical switch for each network, you see? So you can kind of see where that would be more expensive, especially in a network like this. But um, also, with the access points here in the dev accounting and HR VLANs, you can have... Um, wireless, I'm sorry, SSID VLANs, where if going on bigger scale, this is, um, if it was like three floors of a building, you can use other things with like um, trunking and VTP and things like that, or other protocols, and um, you could have on each access point an SSID, so a wireless network, for dev, accounting, and HR, but even if someone from HR goes up to the floor where dev is, they can still connect to HR. Regardless if it's Ethernet, we can make the VLAN go up there onto those switches, or you can have the access point tag them. Now that means this switch from the access point in VLAN 30, that's another 802.1Q trunk. Just like the switch is talking to the firewall and the firewall is talking to the switch with that. But to wrap it all up, basically, if they talk to the Dev, um, the dev SSID, it would tag that to be on VLAN 30 on the Ethernet side of the access point. So you could have three SSIDs in the same access point, but have three logical networks depending on what the wireless client is accessing. They do this a lot in hospitals. You'll see all the access points in there, but um, you have, um, you know, 10 different SSIDs, five different SSIDs. What happens is those are actually all separate VLANs because they get tagged when you go to access them. So that's how you scale things. And honestly, you wouldn't do that with APs in a normal home network. And even a small branch office wouldn't need all this. But just to bring it together, that um, you can do all this with these things. But sometimes with um, things like SmoothWall, IPFire, the things that use the four um, zone uh, naming convention, you'll run out of room with all those if you need more than four networks but that's just by design you that that's this isn't what they're made for this much scaling not to bash on them but that is what does going on with that so with all that i hope this video didn't confuse anybody too bad um but i hope it gave you a little bit more of an idea of how to do this stuff a little bit 
and what's available. And the main things to take away of this, if you take away um, nothing else, take away the types of hardware and the firewall distributions you have available. Okay? That's what I really want you to get from this. But um, with all of that, I'm Tyler with T-Tech, and I really hope you enjoyed this video, and have a very nice day.